Hi everyone, my name is Matt Davis. I am a, uh, an assistant professor of human capital management at NYU. And it is my great pleasure to introduce Matthew Dutton. Uh, he's an associate professor of philosophy and uh, his main research interests are epistemology, philosophy, uh, philosophy of language, uh, religion, and logic. Um, he is the 2020 uh, scholar, or he received the 2020 Scholar of the Year Award. And I am not a philosopher myself, and so I'm not going to uh, make a fool of myself and try to talk about your work, um, but you will, so. <laughs> I will. <laughs> I surely will. <laughs> Thank you. It's great to be here. Great to be here from last year, seeing a bunch of you again. I, I was in a nice position of promising to do my writing that I was got a subgrant for in the year to come from last summer. And so I got it all done, actually. And now I have more to present on than last time. Some of you had already done most of your work before, and now you're just going to repeat yourselves as well largely. But I have some actual, not results, but you know, some ideas I explored. So I, as Matt told, said, I work in philosophy of language, and also in epistemology. And both of these papers are really building on some stuff I've done on each of these. So I wrote one paper on linguistic honesty. I'll talk about that probably for a little bit longer than I should. And then the other paper on what I call interpersonal honesty. The linguistic honesty one is largely related to some of those core questions that Christian began with on uh, what is the, the, the nature and definition of honesty, and also what are the kinds of conditions under which we might say you're less than fully honest, but maybe justifiably so? How to understand that with a, a background or a set of ideas that come from contemporary philosophy of language? Um, I'll talk about that. Then the second one will be on interpersonal honesty, which has to do with how honesty is relevant to our relationships, particularly our personal relationships, um, uh, with an eye on some epistemology of interpersonal knowing, like what is it to know someone in, in relationship? What is it to know someone well? Very few analytic philosophers that work in epistemology discuss that, but I have done some work on that, so I've tried to develop some further ideas related to honesty to capture some pretty common, I think, judgments about what it takes to be someone who someone can know you well, and what it takes for you to be known well. Those, there are facets of honesty that have to do with both of those. Okay, let's see if this works. So, first paper. Philosophers, and especially since Frege uh, in the late 19th century, have been concerned with philosophy of language issues, particularly with respect to the speech act of assertion. So they're mostly thinking about outright assertions like, oh, it's raining in Seattle today, or Olympia is the capital of Washington State, or whatever. Like, when you make a, a claim, you're, you're presenting sort of something about some fact. You're, you're representing the world as being given away. And philosophers have studied this speech act a lot, right? They've also studied a lot of the other side of good, which you might think is good assertions are the like, honest ones maybe, this is where I'm gonna go. But lying is also the other obsession they've had when they've been thinking about declarative speech. And so the setup for this talk is like, well, let's look at the things they've already said a lot, but then let's also look at more subtle ways you can sort of mislead someone, even when you're speaking the truth, or largely the truth. I'm going to get at a picture about how we can understand that and also then develop a definition of what I call fully honest communication. Okay? So when philosophers discuss the nature and disvalue of lying, and as well as good or proper assertions, each of them actually has moral dimensions as well as epistemic ones. So a good assertion is one, if it's honest, and you, what you believe is true, of course, you'd be communicating the truth. right? So they'll be moral in the sense of like you're trying to be helpful. You're not trying to deceive someone. But also the epistemic value of it is, well, you're helping someone out if they believe you because they're learning at least something that's not false. They're learning something that's true. Um, but lying, of course, has the flip side of both of those. So uh, when you lie, assuming you're telling someone something that's false, by your lights anyway, it's false, you're going to be hindering their epistemic uh, needs. <laughs> they're, they're not getting a piece of knowledge, at least. Right? They're getting a falsehood. This is going to be unhelpful. But also the deceptive element usually has moral bearing where like, you're, you're being sort of bad to them. Right? So what this allows right, is a kind of obvious, as it were, spectrum of speech, where on the one hand we have good assertions, best assertions, the ones that are honest maybe, and, and believed, maybe even not known. Right? When, you, when you make a declaration, an outright, an outright declaration like that, um, that's the best kind. On the other side, two dimensions through, it's 
the reverse when you're lying. Okay, so that's what they focused a lot on. Oops, and I'm building on some work that Peter has worked on. I have worked on a lot. The idea in recent philosophy of language and epistemology, this idea, it's kind of a growing consensus, it's still disputed, the idea that there's a norm on assertion, which is not just the expectation, but the requirement that your assertion ought to be known. You do something subpar or problematic, improper even, if you assert without knowing the thing you assert. That is, even if it's believed, maybe even a true belief, you still, it's subpar if it's not knowledge. Okay. We can get into that if you want to discuss that, but I think I'm just building off of that towards some terrain that is uh, less discussed by those philosophers working on that topic, as well as those working on knowledge. So here's the idea, uh, or that is those working on lying. If knowledge is the norm of assertion in this sense, that assertions ought to be known, then we get kind of for free some other stuff related to honesty. If, if, because knowledge requires belief, you, you can't know a fact unless you believe it, right? Then uh, those assertions are honest, right? And if they're known, also we get the epistemic dimension that's relevant to that spectrum. Knowledge then can transmit to it here. If you know something and you tell it to someone else and they believe it, then they can often come to know it straight away, right? Lying by contrast, of course, is dishonest and it inhibits knowledge transmission. If I tell you a falsehood, you're not gonna gain the relevant knowledge because I've given you something false. Knowledge is, as philosophers say, factive. You can't know falsehoods. You can only know truths. So in this way, this area of a li some literature gives us a nice framework to start with on top of what was already a kind of obvious spectrum of like, here are the ends of these, <laughs> here are the poles of this spectrum. Okay, I'm gonna start briefly with, in this paper, this is how I do it, building on the famous philosopher of language, Paul Grice, because I'm thinking, as he did, of conversations as the sort of domain of honesty I'm interested in ling linguistic matters. And he had this picture on which, if you don't know this, it's fine, I'm just gonna briefly blast through it. Um, he had this picture on which conversations are a cooperative endeavor, right? And they also then have goals or ends shared usually by the participants in the conversation. And so there's an interesting feature here of like whether truth will typically be such an end or a goal, right? But he has this cooperative principle, and then he has a bunch of sub-maxims related to how you follow and be cooperative. And then, of course, he's most famous for this idea that you could be cooperative in a conversation, but you could depart from or violate some of those sub-maxims in a way that lets the hearer know what it is that you mean, even though that's not what you said, okay? So here's his cooperative principle. He said, uh, and it's supposed to be a fully general principle that applies to other cooperative endeavors too, but this one's related to conversation. Make your con conversational contribution such as is required at the stage at which it occurs by the accepted purpose or direction of the talk exchange in which you are engaged. That's the cooperative principle. He also has, I didn't put this on a slide, but the maximum of interest to us in honesty is going to be his maximum of quality. It has a super maxim that says, try to make your contribution one that is true. And then two sub maxims below it. Um, do not say that which you believe to be false and do not say that for which you lack adequate evidence. Kind of, in a way, kind of obvious, <laughs> but notice, we, we need to, to sort of put them in play and understand what's going on with them. He also has this great quote that I think is relevant to just understanding the whole framework. He says, anyone who cares about the goals that are central to conversation slash communication, such as giving and receiving information or influencing and being influenced by others, must be expected to have an interest, given suitable circumstances, in participation in talk exchanges that will be profitable only on the assumption that they are conducted in general accordance with the co cooperative principle and the maxims. And the thing that's in, of interest, I think, partly to us here is that we can think of the sort of giving and receiving of information and the, uh, sorry, I can't find it, um, the interest of the participants in any, almost any conversation, not all, you know, we, we have bullshitting context that Frankfurt told us a lot about, but, but for most typical conversations, everyone has the goal of wanting the truth. And so for this reason, his maximum of quality or something nearby related to honesty looks like it's always going to be in play. Okay. Okay. On so, in some other work, I help us begin to look at some like subtleties about even just looking at outright assertion, but I'm going to move to uh, kind of some more subtle ways that, apart from outright asserting, like hedging or, or, or using kind of qualified terminology when you're speaking and not, not outright asserting. 
in order to show that we can be dishonest or depart from being fully honest in ways that matter to us. But even if we just stick to straight up assertions, notice we can apply these sort of general evaluative uh, t uh, categories to actually any actions whatsoever that are governed by rules. But when you apply them to assertions, we get this interesting feature here. We can talk about reasonable assertions where you think you're following the norm of asserting. Suppose it's knowledge. That that's what's required. If that's right, then you'd be asserting what you think you know. Right? You could, of course, assert what you think you know and be wrong about it sometimes. Maybe your evidence is like really amazing, but it turns out it's misleading on a given occasion. You took yourself to know. You asserted the thing. Turns out you were wrong. Well, in, a, in another sense, you should say, yeah, you, you violated the norm, but you were reasonable in doing so. By, as far as you could tell, you were following the norm. Right? This is a fully general thing. If there's a rule, legal rule on sp against speeding in a given context, you know, reasonable driving, if, you're, if your you know, um, speedometer isn't working, you, know, you think you're driving the speed limit. Turns out you're not. Well, you're nevertheless reasonably driving at the speed you are because you think you, in fact, are following the rule. Right? That's reasonable behavior. In this case, reasonable assertion is this. Negligent assertion would be asserting when you don't even consider whether you know. Just like negligent driving would be like not even paying attention to the speed limit or what speed you're driving. Right? And then we can also talk about vicious assertion, which is to say asserting against the norm. If knowledge is the norm, it's asserting when you believe you don't know. And I think of lying actually as a special case of that, where you are asserting, sorry, I think I put, uh, you're, sorry, on the vicious bit. Lying to me is a special case of vicious assertion when you are assert, asserting against what you know because you take yourself to know its negation. It's the opposite, right? Okay. Notice this framework allows us to say reasonable assertions of this sort up here will always be honest assertions. Because when you take yourself to know, it's probably because what you do internally is something like, well, this is what I believe. I, I think this belief amounts to knowledge. I'll go ahead and assert it in this case. Right? But that's a nice feature of this framework. But this, this of course, let me back up. Oh, shoot. This doesn't really tell us much about, this talks about like if you're going to talk, what you're going to say, like whether you're going to be honest and truthful in that way. But it doesn't capture some things we do need to care about related to forthrightness and truthfulness. So in, in Christian's book, he has these five core uh, values of honesty. Two of them look like they're essentially related to communication. One is with forthrightness, one is truthfulness. Okay? The forthrightness virtue says uh, it's you're being disposed to reliably avoid misleading by giving a sufficient presentation of the relevant facts for good moral reasons. The truthfulness one is being disposed to reliably tell the truth for good moral reasons. I think we should, I, I mean, as, as a philosopher of language that's working on these kinds of issues too, I think we, I, want, I want to talk about how you can be dishonest by being misleading in certain kinds of ways, um, particularly related to this, okay? And what I'm going to do is notice from Grice, we get this, but in other cases as well, um, we have explicit communication. When I outright assert something, let's say, my explicit uh, communication is what I asserted. Right? But I can also communicate other things implicitly. And notice if knowledge is the norm, or if there's any norm of assertion, there's something else going on too. There's two levels of communication happening in every such case. If I assert that P, well, P is the thing you're, I'm supposed to be hoping you believe, but I'm also, in a certain sense, representing myself as knowing it if I'm following the norm. So now we have two things, that it's the case and also that I know it. But what's interesting is we can have other things where we distance ourselves from knowing it, like when we hedge against what we, when we hedge with by saying, I think, I believe, probably, right? So we can have implicit communication. Uh, so this, sorry, I didn't skip to this in time, but I mean, implicit communication of one's epistemic position. This isn't just for declarative speech either. Notice interrogatives like questions. In most cases, if I ask you a question, what do I represent about myself and my position? It, Namely, that I don't know the answer, right? I'm interested in you giving me the answer. Why? Because I don't know what an answer. That's usually the case. There are special contexts like pedagogical ones in which that's false. I mean, that's not, that's not the presupposition in play. But in not just declarations or assertions, but also in other kinds of speech, interrogatives, or commands. If I command for, you know, or even request other kinds of imperatives, you know, uh, close the door. <laughs> 
is like a command. Well, that's a kind of command. Authority doesn't really enter into it. But in any such command, you might think, I'm obviously representing myself as having a kind of authority or a kind of a position to ask you to do it. Right? That's in play, too. So it's like the point is you can explicitly communicate one kind of thing, and you can implicitly also communicate some other stuff, too. Grice's famous conversational implicatures are an example of this, but there's others as well. So notice I already hit at this. Hedging terms let one explicitly self-ascribe an attitude to oneself. Like I might say, I believe that such and such is the case. But these often implicitly communicate a diminished epistemic position. I believe the Olympia is the capital of Washington State. I might say that because I'm kind of like not sure. And what I'm doing is I'm importantly hedging against the norm of assertion. I'm, I'm in effect communicating, I don't know it. So, so don't hold me to that, right? But that's why I might have hedged with that term believe, I believe, rather than outright asserting. Peter and I have worked on this a bit, um, on hedged language and how, how, how this is related to the norm of assertion and some other position misrepresentation. I'm going to build on um, Peter's work in just a minute. Peter wrote a recent paper, he kind of beat me to it in a way, uh, where he just, it's called hedging testimony. He talks about a norm. On declarative speech, he calls it the p-norm, positional norm. Because if you're signaling your epistemic position toward the content or the proposition you're talking about by the way you speak, even if you're hedging, right, there seems to be a broader norm in play nevertheless. So it looks like you must be such that if you're going to use a declarative with a content, in a context, this gets kind of you know, abstract, but just, just go with me. You can only do that if you're occupying the epistemic position that's signaled by that declarative in that context. So um, he has a... I built a little bit more into this, but the version of this that he began with just lacks a few of these uh, rows. You can think of the array of these below this first line. If you state or assert that P, the thing you're signaling is that you know it. That's what you're representing. And so the requirement then is that you must know it. Duh. You represented it, <laughs> so you better have it, right? But all these below it are weaker than knowledge, notice. I think, I guess, probably, I, I predict, I added this one in. Uh, I have a paper related to predictions and expectations where it looks like you better at least expect the thing is going to be the case if you're going to predict that it's going to turn out that way. Suspect being possible. Hope is also another one. Hope, importantly, he, hope ascriptions to yourself, importantly, hedge against knowing. Right? I'll give you an example of this in a minute. Right? The point, though, is if you're going to use of, of this norm, if you're going to use one of these, these also still commit you to occupying a certain position. I can't say that I hope that such and such is the case if I don't even hope it, or, or if I don't even wish or want it to be the case. Right? I can't say I suspect that it's so when I don't suspect that it's so. What this allows is more than one way in which you can misrepresent yourself. And related to honesty, we're going to, we're going to care about this. That means you could speak truthfully, but nevertheless still represent your epistemic position. So here it is again, just put on the top of the slide. Peter talks about this, and I want to make use of it. You can overrepresent yourself in your epistemic position when you occupy a weaker position than the one that's signaled by your utterance. Let's suppose you only think that P, but you go ahead and assert outright that P. Well, if you assert outright, you represent yourself as knowing P, but you merely thought that it was so, you're overrepresenting your epistemic position. You can underrepresent, though, when you occupy a stronger position than that which is signaled by your utterance. This is the one we want to keep in mind going forward for the next few minutes because it's really interesting the way it breaks. I might know that something is the case, but I might hedge nevertheless. Uh, if I know that Rebecca, my, uh, you know, my colleague, is in her office in the, down the hall one day uh, eating lunch, but she closed the door, uh, she didn't want to be bothered, and a student comes and asks if she's in her office, I don't know, for some reason I might hedge and be like, yeah, she might be there. <laughs> because I don't want to be the one who told them straight up that she's there. Right? In doing so, I've misrepresented my knowledge. I do know, but I distanced myself from knowing. But there's a way in which that's subtle, subtly dishonest. Like, it's a de what I want to say is a departure from being fully honest. And it might be permissible in lots of cases, but the point is you can subtly misrepresent yourself. Finally, sorry, I forgot this last one. Ah, shoot. There's one more here. You can anti-represent when you occupy a position toward not P while you signal a position toward P. 
This is pretty much akin to lying, but here's an example of it with this weaker language. Um, suppose I uh, suppose I think that not p is true, right? But what I do is I say I think that p. Well, what I've done is represent a position toward the negation of what I think. That's of course often going to be a lie because I, I won't I won't be thinking that p because I thought I think that not p. So. In lots of cases, anti-representing, just as like lying. I'm less interested in that for the purposes of this kind of paper and more interested in, in this underrepresenting material. So this le leads me in this paper. By the way, I've written up these papers. If people want to read the drafts of them, I'm happy to email them to people and take a look. I'd love your feedback. Um, they'll be sent to journals before too long, so it'd be useful to have the feedback sooner rather than later. Um, I develop a, a definition of fully honest communication where it captures the import of these other implicit types of communication. So an utterance is going to, by a speaker is going to be fully honest if and only if for every proposition that they intend to communicate or implicate in uttering their, their, their utterance, making their utterance, they ex accept it as true. I just use accept as a kind of catch-all for a kind of mental or, uh, endorsement. It could be belief. It doesn't need to be that. It could be just I have a high enough credence toward it. Like I lean that way, basically. Um, and, and, and also, it needs to include also propositions about your epistemic position or your propositional attitudes toward P. So if I say I hope that P when I don't even hope that P, of course that's anti-representing, that's bad. But in a different kind of case, I might say I hope that P uh, when uh, like, I do know that P. That'd be weird. So here's a kind of case I borrow from um, Quinn White. Uh, and I use it actually in the other paper too. Think of this kind of case. It actually blends together multiple layers of representation. Suppose you have a woman, Claudia, who has just been diagnosed with cancer. She goes to her office or her workplace. She doesn't want to share this around yet. And she has this nosy colleague that they're not even, she's not even really good friends with or anything, Nick. And Nick is kind of catching some subtle signs of hers and is like, kind of bluntly asks her, do you have cancer? <laughs> And Quinn White uses this for, as in a case where he's like, I think this is totally permissible to lie to him in this case. But let's suppose, to change the case a little bit, that Claudia doesn't want to lie. Let's suppose she also doesn't want to deflect and change the subject so that he infers that maybe she's hiding something. So what she says in response to, do you have cancer, is she says, I hope not. But she knows she has cancer. In this case, you can discern two layers of what's going on. Notice. She's expressed something that's true because hope plausibly dissolves into desiring as well as not knowing, <laughs> right? She does know. So she's misrepresented, or she has, I guess, underrepresented herself and her epistemic position by saying, I hope not. But she has accurately represented her other cognitive state of desiring because she desires she doesn't have cancer, but she knows she does have cancer, right? Interesting. So I think this captures what. What, we, what will allow us to say makes for slight departures from being fully honest. Right? You can talk about ways you can be less than fully honest, even though with respect to what you said, you might have told the truth and shared what you know and only said what you believe. Right? But you can, you can implicitly misrepresent yourselves and your epistemic position in these other ways that are pretty common. I just think we don't, you, we don't do this very much. But of course, given, given this, you could easily, you could easily underrepresent and carefully do so all the time, right? Okay. Um, this definition then captures cases of underrepresentation that's still counting as less than fully honest, which I think is useful to have as a good definition of what makes for full-blown honesty. And like I said, it's, it can it can capture that even for a speaker who has only asserted truths that they know. I also I'm not going to talk about this, but I have a whole section of the paper toward the end where. There's a, there's a great book by Andreas Stoke, who's a philosopher of language, who wrote a book on lying and, and insincerity. But his definition of honesty, actually his is a definition of insincerity, but the point is that you can still capture what he's getting at in the same kinds of ways. His definition of insincerity doesn't capture cases of underrepresentation as counting as insincere or dishonest, or in any way so. And I think that in that way, this, this, this move, or at least something along these lines, is a better, a better account of that. It also explains then how speakers can be truthful, even if they're not fully forthright. So I can, I can say things I know that are truthful, but I'm not being fully forthright if I know something 
And the conversation is, is directing in a certain way where, well, people are kind of hoping the people who know will chime in and share what they know. If I, in effect, underrepresent my epistemic position, maybe for the right kinds of moral reasons, but I, but I nevertheless re represent myself as not knowing the thing when you know, it could be that I could do better, then I haven't asserted or, or spoken as accurately as I could with respect to what I know. Okay, So that's the gist of the first paper. How much time do I have left? I'm only going 20-ish, 5, 20. Uh, probably like a couple minutes. Okay. Here's the second paper in a, in a very quick, quick <laughs> nutshell. Second paper is trading on the idea that we should be able to distinguish between uh, the sort of range of how well you know someone. Think of, think of strangers. I mean, I'm, I'm interested in basically what does it take to be known well, where that's better than just knowing someone personally. Okay. Um, I have some, some, some paper, a paper, at least one, on knowledge, n knowing someone. And I don't really focus on that paper on knowing someone well. So this paper lets me go in that direction. I think norms of interpersonal, what I call interpersonal honesty are related to what it would take to know someone well. And so I'm focusing on this. If you think of this as a kind of spectrum, you don't even know someone. And then you become at least acquaintances. You know each other personally at some level, but not very deeply. Knowing someone well is getting deeper. right? Um, Talbert, there's this great paper by Vani Talbert in which she talks about necessary conditions of knowing someone well. The ones of interest to us here are the second one and the third one. She says, the context of those interactions were such as to permit someone to reveal important aspects of themselves, and they have done so. That's related to forthrightness. And they've not deceived, themselves, uh, deceived us about themselves in important respects. Right? So it's a non-deception requirement. This is just related to the forthrightness and truthfulness kind of ideas. right? Now, I use this little modifier for the idea that you know someone personally. You, you have interpersonal knowledge if you know them in relationship at any level, and they know you. So here are the, the ideas I'm going for. These are kind of no, what I call instrumental norms. I think they're, oh, I got, I got, it's supposed to be causal. <laughs> um, they're instrumental norms in the sense that following these norms enables this to happen. It helps contribute to their happening. And, and there's a way in which, because these, the first ones I give are necessary conditions, A and B here, that if you don't follow them, that, that can block someone from coming to know you well. That is, if you're going to lie to someone, or you're not going to share certain aspects of yourself as they become relevant maybe to when you're talking to each other, then there's a way in which you're hindering their coming to know you well. Right? That is, you have to be largely forthright about yourself to someone else. The domain we're talking about is yourself. It's a kind of sharing norm. You better share some things about yourself. And I say largely because like this, you don't have to be perfect at this, but you at least have to be disposed to do this. And you have to be non-deceptive. And this generates this A bit, the first one, generates, I think, a kind of guidance norm. That is, a guidance norm, not an instrumental norm in that sense, but at least provides guidance so as to keep you from veering into the vice of excess. <laughs> so it's a guardedness norm in this case. You exercise guardedness in not sharing too much or too vulnerably about oneself too soon <laughs> in the relationship. So that, of course, could turn someone off and actually also hinder them from knowing you well. So you have to be a little bit careful about this. You could be guarded somewhat, but you can't be so guarded that you don't share very much about yourself whatsoever. That is, you'll never be known well if you don't follow these, is the idea. What is fascinating as I was working on this is that this generates another, the kind of uptake norm on the recipient side. Here it is again, just on the top of the slide. It's, you need two to tango, as it were, here in the, for a relationship. You need the recipient to do the right things in a kind of, some, kind of way related to honesty in order for them to come to know the person who's sharing about themselves well. So I don't know what to call these other than sharing and uptake norms. but. You can contribute to knowing someone well only if you're largely responsive to their being forthright about themselves, and if you're largely non-manipulative in interpreting or believing what they share. The idea here is if you aren't even responsive, like if you're not even listening to them or remembering what they say or what seems to be important to them about what they've shared about, you know, about themselves over time, then you're not going to be getting to know them well. But also, if you, if you are kind of manipulating someone to kind of, I don't know, to, in a way, turn them into someone you want them to be rather than let them be themselves, then of course there's a sense in which you're also not knowing them well. In fact, you're kind of acting in a way to manipulate them into being someone else. Right? This, this C also generates a guidance uh, norm, or a, a restraint, uh, um, yeah, guidance norm related to restraint. 
you can't prod too much about them in kind of eliciting them sharing about themselves. Again, that's to protect, protect against the vice of excess. But again, that's, these, these are instrumental norms. Whoops. Um, these are instrumental norms that need to be followed. These two are guidance norms, which you could violate and still come to know someone well, but it's just like good guidance. Okay. What I love about this is these look like they're mirror images of each other, structurally, as it were. The first ones, the A and C, notice, um, the, the, they're the kind of thing that if you're going to engage with it, you better do it the right way. But for B and for D, silence satisfies B and D. So like, because these are negative, non-manipulative, non-deception, doing nothing at all is a way of satisfying those two, right? And because the first ones in each case, C in this case there, and A here, are related to guidance norms, you might think, look, these just are like the kind of mirror images of what each party, what, of where they're going to come to know each other, at least on some deeper level, have to, what they have to do. I only have like a second left, I know. But this is, this is all building toward actually, well, it wasn't meant to do this, but there's a, this paper by Quinn White. He actually, that I got that Claudia cancer blunt question case about from, he actually has a rather different view that I think's wrong. He, I, he doesn't talk about norms like this, but having built up these, I thought, well, these are need to be in place in order for you to move from, say, stranger to acquaintance to knowing someone bet on better terms. And then there's a kind of spectrum of like, are you close friends or fr friends or close acquaintances? Are you going to become intimates, lovers, something? There's like a kind of like gradations of how well you know someone, right? Quinn's got this paper where he says, no, the relationships themselves establish or determine what the norms are of honesty and discretion that are in place. And I think that's totally backwards because you need norms like that in the first place to get into such relationships. It can't be that the relationships themselves determine what the norms are. You need norms just to inhabit relations like these. You need to get at them by following them, these norms. So even if he's right that there's a kind of contextual element to some relationships mean in some cases you barely know each other, like the nosy Nick example, you, you, you don't have to tell him the truth when he asks bluntly that question. That might be true. But the, the question is, do the relationships determine what the norms are? And I think that, that can't be right. I think the norms have to be stable enough to make it the case that you'd, in effect, implicitly follow them in order to become in relationship of various kinds. I mean personal relationships, not like structured ones like professional roles or things like that. So that's the idea. And that's about all I had because I know I had very little time. So that's it. I appreciate you listening. Thanks for any questions you've got. Do, do you take them or do you want me? I think okay. I, uh, all right, I'll just start with you because I saw you first. Uh, okay, so you got the like tripartite distinction between assertions, between reasonable, negligent, and vicious. Mm -hmm. okay. You want me to go back? And the, the middle category, the negligent one, that's supposed to be a prank or bullshit. Uh, yeah, I think that's pretty much bullshitting, yeah. Where is it? And so, and so the dying, and, and we're assuming that bullshit is generally dishonest. Um, well, not okay. necessarily. Because okay. cool. you could, so if, so, sorry, let me just, I don't mean to interrupt the question. Not at all. But you could be bullshitting and bullshitting with, like, communicating stuff you do believe. You could, but it's because you're not, on my view, and at least if that's supposed to be along the lines of bullshit, the negligent thing then you're just kind of talking with, and you're not even consulting whether you believe various things. So it could be, it could be things you say are, are honest in the sense that you're saying what you think. This is exactly but they don't have to. This is exactly where I'm going. Okay. Right? Like as Frankfurt thinks that bullshit is characterized by disregard for the truth, not like you know, aiming at falsehood. It's just you, you don't care whether truth yeah. figures in, in your assertions. And so you could know full well P but go about asserting P for different reasons because you know P will convince your audience or because right. you like the way P sounds or whatever. <laughs> like, uh, and so you'll be negligent in that sense, but you won't be misrepresenting yourself because you do in fact know. Right. Right. So you notice you, you could sometimes be, in a way, negligent but following the norm. Yeah. yeah, yeah. It's just in that case it'd be accidental. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. You'd be lucky, as it were. But... I mean, the bullshitting thing is a little bit weird, too, because Frankfurt sometimes in places talks about, uh, like, 
he doesn't, he's not that clear whether he means it to be a speech act of its own or whether it rides on having yeah. done the normal asserting or whatever. And so to the extent that this gets kind of murky, I, I don't really feel like I need to take a stand. But you're right that this sort of categorization of like these layers, I, th I think of these as layers of evaluation of an agent, can be such that you can evaluate the agent in a certain kind of way uh, where they are to be credited or to be you know, discredited, whether or not they've in fact conformed to a, some norm okay, like cool. that. Yeah. Awesome. Good. Yeah, I really enjoyed the talk, so, so thank you. Um, that's sort of a, a weird case, but I, I think it's helpful. So it's just about um, whether what you're saying about fully honest uh, captures sort of the intuitive notion of being fully honest. So, um, mm. you know, imagine I'm talking to my friend Al or acquaint my acquaintance Al, right, about our friend Frank, right? So um, Al asks me, oh, do you know where Frank's from? And I say, um, I know that, that Al uses some morally troubling heuristics about uh, different places. So if I tell Al the exact detailed neighborhood that Frank is from, he'll uh, form some false beliefs about, uh, about Frank. Frank's mm -hmm. violent or, or uneducated, something, something bad that's false and not, not true about Frank. Right. So I violate a grassy norm, and I just say something more general than you know than what I actually know. I just say, oh, he's from the south part of the city or something, rather than the exact neighborhood. Mm -hmm. um, I'm implicating something false about myself, you know, because by the grassy norm, I'm implicating that I don't know exactly where he lives. Um, but I've got the sense that that's not really dishonest. I mean, I'm actually helping Al out. Uh, you know, if I were to say the exact place, he'd end up with all these false beliefs about Frank. Um, so I guess, uh, and just a quick follow-up, you know, one, one, one thing you could say is that, well, yeah, it's a little bit dishonest, not fully honest, but you should do it anyway. And then my worry if you say that is, well, you know, I like, I like uh, exceptionless commands, and you should always be honest with your face. I guess you could say that <laughs> if, if you go that way. So yeah, I just sort of wonder. <clears throat> Good. So that's great. Really good. That's a case where you are intending, in a way, to underrepresent, or, or at least, you, that's maybe a case where you could have said something more, cl more specific, but you didn't. It's a bit like Grice has a case uh, like this, where he talks about someone they're planning a trip in the south of France, and they're like, it's like, where does so and so live? And he's like, somewhere in the south of France. But but it's because he's trying to signal he doesn't know exactly where. In this case, you still might be signaling you don't know but it was for good moral reasons, as it were. Well, I'm going to ask about this. Moral reasons or, com or epistemic reasons? Because you said you don't want to form false beliefs, but you also tied it in a kind of moral encroachment way yeah. to yes, if I'll he has these false beliefs, he'll think of him in a different way, yeah. right? Yes, yeah, so I think there's moral and epistemic reasons, because uh, Al will get false beliefs about Frank, because Frank uh, doesn't. Uh, Frank isn't violent or uneducated in any of these things that the heuristic instructs him to say. Mm -hmm. So, you know, insofar as you don't want Al to have false beliefs, that's, that's good. But also moral because, you know, you don't want to encourage the use of this troubling heuristic or something like that. So, yeah. Yeah. I mean, I'll just say, I'm interested in trying to define what, the, uh, what makes the utterance on a given occasion fully honest or what would tell us why it's less than fully honest. But I'm not here giving us a norm on which you ought to always be fully honest. Right. Um, I think I, if, if I had to put some cards on the table with respect to this, I think I'd say there's a norm that you ought to be honest in the sense of um, what you assert be something you believe, right? And also a forthrightness thing, you, but you ought to share when it's relevant things you do believe or know. But, uh, I mean, that, that may be not a moral consideration, but it's at least you're not going to violate the truthfulness thing. Whether you ought to be fully honest in this sense might depend on a whole range of factors that don't accrue, don't contribute to you being morally uh, subpar or something. Um, but you can imagine, I talk about this in the paper somewhere, the person who might chronically underrepresent their epistemic position, because they're like always hedging, they're just like never going to commit, <laughs> may, I mean, depends on what's behind there. If they're just like, like unduly humble, they don't want to act like a know-it-all or something. <laughs> That's one thing. But if it's because they're like uncertain about stuff because they just feel like they're never in a good position to know what it is they know, so they, they're just going to be careful. I mean, I don't, know how, I don't know how to evaluate an agent like that exactly. There's lots of things to say. So yeah, I'm not, I'm not giving it. I'm normally interested in giving norms. Here, I'm just giving a definition. <laughs> yeah, but that's a, great, that's a great set of considerations. I appreciate that. We are running a little short on time. Uh, so probably only a few more. Yeah. Um, so I'm trying to think of a case um, 
where somebody with a kind of intellectual humility, of course, we could debate about what the hell intellectual humility is, <laughs> but maybe someone like Socrates and or yeah. someone who's Socratic. Yeah, like, good. And be, because of their intellectual humility, they might hedge, or they might just make an expectation for them to hedge even implicitly. But then we might hear it and we think, well, then this person doesn't really know, but in fact they do know. Then um, would we call someone like, in, in that kind of case, that's a credit by person less than fully honest? Um, I, I'm just trying to, trying to work it out in, in terms of somebody who, they're not trying to misrepresent. So I, 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 I hanging out with Christian too much of the last week has, I just have <laughs> honesty and distortion. And, and so maybe I need to like chug that out of my mind. but. It's not trying to distort, it's just like the way that they come across is just because they're intellectually, I don't know if too intellectually humble, maybe if I start becoming ambitious, but it's their intellectual humility. They, they, they understand that they're not certain, and because of that, they realize, yeah, I might be wrong, and I, I want to be open minded and recognize that yeah. these counterexamples, people disagree with me, might, these defeaters that, sure, I, I think I have defeated defeaters, but who knows, maybe I, I've got the mistake, and so I, I keep having this kind of implicit hedging. I wonder if that person would count as less than fully honest under your account. Yeah, I mean, that's a good, I'm not sure I actually want it to be as strong as r ruling out some kinds of cases. So maybe you need to add some qualifiers in here. For example, in a, pe in a certain kind of pedagogical context or like a parent with a child, you know, one way to proceed might be, well, just tell them everything you know all the time. But another way might be just back off and often let them help, like, work with them to help them come to the answers or figure it out. And to do that, you'd probably have to be like, what, you know, they ask you a question, and instead of giving your answer straight off, you might be like, well, I don't know, what do you think about this? Because you're, what you're trying to do is get them to learn, right? Or, or, or feel their way around the answers or something. And so it might be that some context, like pedagogical one, I mean, if we speak broadly in that sense, even parenting and pedagogy, pedagogy in that sense, it might be that some contexts are ones where it doesn't touch whether you're fully honest, but because the right kinds of moral reasons or something, or the right kinds of epistemic reasons are in play where I'm trying to foster, just like Socrates is trying to get them to come up with their answers. It's, it's in a way maybe also related to matters of epistemic injustice for those of you who work in epistemology and know this stuff from Fricker and Medina and others, where you might be like, I have reasons for not representing myself as knowledgeable here, maybe because I need to center you and get you to come to know, or, or you to share what you know. So that's a good, Eric, I appreciate it. I, I think I may want to talk about which contexts matter here, because there might be contexts where we just shouldn't even call that a less than, like a departure from full honesty or something. Good. Um, yeah, I'm moving to the interpersonal one. Uh, I thought that actually you were gonna result, you were gonna conclude that these were relationship uh, norms. So I was very surprised that you say that they are not. Um, that you say the norms comes before the relationship, right? If I understood you well, right? You say that the norm comes before uh, the relationship, and White says that the relationship is the one determining the norms. I understood you right. Yeah, pretty much. Right. So. I think, the, I think wife is right here. And so for example, think about um, the CIA wife, right? Your wife is in the CIA, so you know, she's very open with you about her character and about what she cares about, but she tells you nothing about her job. Um, that's acceptable in that relationship. That's, a, that's for rightness that like, doesn't require her to disclose that. But imagine your wife is a philosopher, right? And you're a philosopher as well. It would be super weird if she's going around like publishing papers and going to conferences and hiding it from you because you share that in your relationship. So for rightness, it's going to be different and it's going to depend on the relationship. And it's also going to result on whether you know each other well in the realms that you should. So good. Uh, realms that you should. Yeah. Where does that come from? Mm. Well, you could say it, different. it could be should in a chain of like impersonal kind of norms, right? Because of like considerations that are like out with the relationship, like you're in the CIA, you need to protect the government. But it should also be should in terms of like relationship dependent norms, right? Because I owe you the truth about some things but not about others yeah. in our relationship. Sure, good. So good. This is useful insofar as I think right is uh, white is right <laughs> about 
some element of this. But the case you have in mind, I think, nevertheless, the, all I'm driving at here is in that CIA spouse case, the spouse that doesn't know they work for the CIA doesn't know them very well. So, so if well is marking a kind of threshold above which <laughs> you, you, know, you pass, if, now, this gets tricky because what counts as most important to someone where you got to know those things to know them well, that's a real, I talk about this a bit in the paper. I think it's actually, I'm kind of pluralistic about this where like, I think, I think it's just not that clear. There's some things that look like they could count as if you don't share them about yourself, you're hindering them from knowing you well. And then other kinds of things which you might from the outside be like, that's important to their background, their history, their life, who they are. But they have the right kinds of reasons, maybe related to authenticity, where they're like, they want to put forward them, versions of themselves that they want you to know now. That maybe in some kinds of cases like that, it wouldn't. Like, not, like hiding those background bits could not hinder you from coming to know them well. The, so insofar as the thing you're concerned about, I think is that these uh, don't always capture the domains of normativity according to which we sometimes ought to share things. Yes, it's not, and they're not built to do all of that. In particular, they're not built to tell us which sorts of relationships then require more forthrightness or, or more sharing than others. I'm, I'm mainly just interested in this broad notion of knowing someone well, where when you are spouses, let's say, you're at some level, I suppose, supposed to know each other well, <laughs> to, to, for it to be a good relation, a good, healthy, re flourishing relationship, right? And so in those, it could, be that the, it could be that the sorts of things about which you shouldn't, or you, you should disclose or share, changes, the domain changes. But these norms are supposed to capture that. The only thing with white that I was worried about is that white wants to say, the relationship itself determines what norms are in play. And the way he goes about that isn't as specific and detailed as this, but insofar as I might be pushing him to do better or different, I, what I'm trying to say is you need some norms like this related to honesty and discretion to be in place in the first place for you to get to know each other to even count as being in these relationships. Insofar as he doesn't account for that, that's where I think my adding this might help his, might even help his project actually. That help? Good. Yeah, sorry. Actually, I mean, similar question, but I think help maybe as a follow-up. Isn't it the case, though, that if we wanted a different kind of relationship, these norms would look different, right? So you can imagine yeah. a dominating relationship, and the linguistic norms for interpersonal knowledge would be very different. So the, the actual structure of these norms is very much shaped by the fact that we want a relationship that's facilitating mutual cooperation, reciprocal, shows mutual respect. And in that sense, right, the relationship namely the kind of relationship we want, really does come prior to the, the generation of the norms. Oh, so good. So th this is actually a very deep and complicated question that I haven't, actually haven't thought too deeply about and I want, I would like to think more about it. But the point you're, I think you're, it's behind what you're saying is related to the point I want to make, which is that you can't, on, on White's picture, I don't see yet how you could do this. Suppose we, again, this is very basic, but suppose we are merely acquaintances and then we both want to get to know each other more, like moving too well, knowing each other well, right? or becoming friends or something. That's supposed to be a kind of achievement. We need to both work at it to do this. These norms are telling us how to, how to go about that. But the point is you can't move from those to the, on this picture, you can't move from the one to the other, assuming you both want it, without following these. And so in that, if that's right, then in that sense, these are more fundamental than the relationship itself. Because these help explain how it is you could arrive at the, being in that relationship. So that's maybe all I mean. But I think you're right that what, there's a tricky thing here, but what if one person wants something from the relationship to become one thing and the other one doesn't? Of course, the discrepancy. Um, but also, you might think those kinds of factors are instrumental in the sense that you both have to have that goal. And if you, if you both have a certain kind of goal that's not merely related to knowing each other well, but to some, for something else that's related to the relationship, but it's not just captured by this basic epistemic stuff, 
then sure, the wanting those things will generate maybe more nuanced or detailed norms that help you help say more maybe that we would want to say. So that, that does seem right, yeah. Very good, thanks. Is that it? Yeah. Thank you, appreciate it. If anyone's interested, let me, send me an email. I'll send you the drafts of these. I'm happy to share that with you if you want.